Isaiah chapter 53. And while you're turning there, I want to take this opportunity to say how honored I am to be here today. It is a privilege of mine to be here in this service. I'm looking forward to God speaking to our hearts. How many come ready for a word of the Lord to talk to your spirit today? And uh, give honor to your pastor, Brother Gaddy, and his family. How many are thankful for the man of God in your life today? Amen. Praise God. And all the staff and the great, great dinner theater last night. That was awesome. And um, I videoed the 12 Days of Christmas because that was pretty legit. Now, if you start busting out dancing like that today, I'm going to lose it. I'm just going to tell you. I'm going to lose it. I'm going to lose it. I wish you'd bust a move in here. Come on, somebody. <laughs> it was wonderful. Such a great hospitality. I'm just excited to be in the kingdom of God such a time as this. Isaiah chapter 53, uh, verse 1. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? And he shall grow up before him as a tender plant. Everybody say a tender plant. As a root out of a dry ground, he hath no form of cunningness. And when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. I used to think that this scripture was talking about me every now and then. Looking in the mirror. Wow, whoa, what's going on? Anyways, that's my corny personality. Thank you. But he is despised and rejected of men, man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. It's unique that the Bible says that, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He is despised, and we esteemed him not. And surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken and smitten of God and afflicted. Verse 5 is what I want to focus on this morning. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes, we are what? Healed. I would like to bring this subject for your consideration today and preach on these words, but he was wounded. I know there's people in this room today you've dealing with the frustrations of life, but he was wounded. I know there's people in this room that have sickness in your body, but he was wounded. Marital situations and economies putting stress on our lives, but he was wounded. Would you lay your Bibles down and lift up your hands? Let us pray the Lord will help us for just a few moments to give us some strength in this congregation. I need to touch the Lord in my life this very moment. Father, in the name of Jesus, help us today, God. Come on, would you lift your voices and help us today? God, I thank you for your favor, for your abundant grace and mercy. Thank you for shedding your blood on Calvary. God, thank you for being the atonement of our sin. God, we give you praise and adoration today. We just want to come and say thank you, Lord, for all you've done for us. I pray that you'd make my tongue the pen of the hand of the ready rider that may speak your word. Let it penetrate the heart of every person in this room tonight. In Jesus' name, we give you glory and praise. Now, would you put your hands together and clap them under the Lord and give them a shout of praise and ovation of worship. Man, you may be seated in Jesus' name. But he was wounded. I have taken some interesting notes along the journey that we call life. And um, one of my favorite avenues of finding relief from stress and pain and frustration is through the venue of music. Obviously, we pray. We ask God to help us. But sometimes there just comes a point where I've just got to turn on my iTunes and let it rip. Just got to let it blast as loud as I can. My wife may get a little aggravated, but I pray her through afterwards, and it's okay. So <laughs> such were some of you, but you have, you know how that is. And she's not here today, so I can say what I want, right? You know, No, 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 that's just a joke. But... In my studies of the direction of the Holy Ghost that I felt today, I was reminded of this message that I have preached before, but for some reason I could not shake it. And I've known about coming here for a couple of months, and I've asked God to give me a different word. I prayed that He would let me have something 
that's a little more ah, rocking and going crazy, but God reminded me that it's not about me, it's about Him. And, and God reminded me of this word in a very difficult season of my life, and I will share with you in just a few moments. But before we get there, I want to talk about this, this issue of music. I begin today with a story of a man named Thomas Andrew Dorsey, who was indeed a jazz musician from Atlanta. In the 20s, if you read about him, you'll realize that he gained a certain amount of notoriety as a composer of jazz tunes, at the time had very suggestive lyrics, but in 1926 he gave all of that away to concentrate exclusively on spiritual music. One of his favorite songs that he wrote and that he is best known for is Peace in the Valley. There's a story behind this most famous song that deserves to be told because in 1932, Times for Dorsey were just very difficult. Trying to survive the Depression years as a working musician meant tough sledding. And on top of that, his music was not accepted by very many people. Some in the church said it was too much of the worldly, the devil's music. Boy, I've heard that before. I am a friend of God. I'm not going to go there anyway, so you get my point, right? His reality was that it soothed him. It caused him to find a release from his stress. And many years later, he could joke about it, saying, you know, I got kicked out of some of the greatest churches in all the land because I was leading the devil's music. But, man, people were getting saved all the time. The reality is this, that the kick in the teeth came one night in St. Louis when he had received a telegram informing him that his pregnant wife had died suddenly. Dorsey was filled with so much grief that his faith was shaken to the roots, but instead of wallowing in self-pity, he turned to the discipline that he knew best, that was writing music. And in the middle of agony, he wrote the following words that I present to us. Precious Lord, take my hand. Lead me on. Let me stand. I am tired. I am weak. I am worn. Through the storm and through the night, Lead me on to that light. Precious Lord, take my hand and lead me home. For this gentleman, he understood this very well, that a song written as a way of coping with his personal pain could very well be the venue that would lead him through the toughest, darkest season of his life. But I believe it is safe to say that if we live long enough, we will experience some heartache and disappointment and complete helplessness, but I have a word that I'd like to present to us this morning to encourage us that regardless of where we're at in our life, there's a God who loved us so much, who robed himself in flesh and came to this earth and he was wounded for everything that we're going through. The Bible tells us that the Lord is a refuge for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. In consideration of this reality, I would like to draw a very quick conclusion that what Isaiah prophesied indeed would come to pass. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. When you consider the fact that the Son of God came to this earth he surprised a lot of people. Jesus robed in himself in the flesh, coming here, walking God-ordained in the flesh, no one like him. There's one Lord, one faith, and one baptism, and only one way to find an atonement for our sin. He surprised a lot of people because he was literally a baby born in a manger, royalty born in poverty. And from the moment of his birth, Jesus was always doing things differently than what people expected. Here's why. Because he refused to follow a script. He was moved and walked around with compassion. He was a man on a mission, but the mission was one that very few could understand. It was Jesus Christ, oh hallelujah, that taught us how to love like no other man could ever love. Therefore we find that he was extending grace everywhere that he went, in the middle of those always extending a guilty stain. But nobody in his eyes was without hope. Every life mattered. He loved the prostitute as much as he loved of the preacher. He said, 
In reality, I've come to seek and to save that which was lost. I would like to tell you that Jesus sought the lonely. He sought the hurting and the destitute. The Bible says that he was always there to restore life when he was gone. Whether it was healing the sick or raising the dead or causing the blind to see the crippled to walk. No matter where you look, Jesus was always performing a miracle. It's because his mindset was I've got to save them from this untoward generation. What does this have to do with us today? Where are you trying to take us in this message? I've come to tell you that the same love that Jesus extended when he was on this earth was therefore extended to us when he took the grave sentence upon his life when he died. And we're going to get there in just a few moments, but I want to tell you very closely in the beginning of this message that none of us in this room deserve the opportunity that is extended to us this very moment to live a life that's blessed by the abundance of the Holy Ghost. I want to tell you I'm so thankful that I have been filled with the gift of the Holy Holy Ghost, and I've been baptized in Jesus' name, having all of my sins washed away. I wouldn't take nothing for my journey now. But here's what you've got to realize the things that God is wanting us to hear today. Isaiah 53, verse 2. If you could turn me up a little bit in this monitor, I would greatly appreciate it. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 2 says that for he shall grow up as a tender plant. Everybody say tender plant as a root out of a dry ground. I've heard this referenced and preached many times, and although it is not original, I wish it were, but I want to share with you something that has deeply impacted my life and moved me. I am convinced by the God that the greatest messages we can preach are the ones that impact us the most, not the ones that we can find everybody else preaching and plagiarism is in the pulpits. I really believe that we are moved with the greatest messages that change us. They say that we're overcomers by the word of our testimony. This reached me because looking into the eyes of this text and what it's trying to say to us, trying to speak to us, is that if you were to compare Jesus to some sort of a tree or a plant, there's only one thing you can really consider him being as. That is an olive tree. The olive tree is very impressive. But most importantly, it's what they get from the olive tree. It's the olives that fall from the tree. But you would think that the olives are the most impressive things, but yet that's not even the end of the story. It's what comes out of the olive that is the most impressive thing about it. But it's the process of getting what comes out of the olive that's eye-catching to me. It's called the oil press. It begins by growing an olive tree, then harvesting the olives and placing them into an intense crushing process. This brings out the greatness from the olive. And there are various styles and flavors of olives and olive oil. But the essence in the entire process is the same. Without the crushing, there would be no valuable substance at all. When you crush the olive, the oil flows with great purity and great substance. It's been said that Gethsemane was a place of crushing per se as an olive press. In fact, the Bible tells us that if you look through everything, that Jesus was in agony. The word agony in Greek means to be engaged in combat. But if you define Gethsemane in its Hebrew meaning, it means the oil press. So in other words, Jesus is fighting, engaged in combat, being crushed, trying to save us from the sin of this world mindset, the reality of the oil press. You can see it there on the screen. Begins to go through our minds. He understands that he has to go through this process. It's here that he is betrayed by Judas. It's interesting to note that Judas kissed the door of heaven right on his way to hell. You think that it's easy just to walk through life and just have a simple mistake and and find it. But Judas took this answer in the wrong way. He killed himself. He never had a chance to find the redeeming grace. But there is a man in the Bible named Peter who the Bible tells us preached the day of Pentecost. Peter received the keys. It's because they understood that no matter how many mistakes I make or how much I may fall short of the glory of God, the reality is this, that he was wounded and though he was crushed and he was bruised, it was For my good. But here's something I have to understand for my personal life. It's great to note that the olive crushing was intensive. 
it was imperative to understand that it's not just for the oil and not just for Jesus, but my own self. I had to experience a crushing. I had to experience a moment in my life to where everything I thought that was going to be great found out to be the opposite of what I wanted. I tell you this very humbly this morning that I come from a broken home and I'm not, I'm not here to, 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 to ask you for applause and I'm not here to ask for acclimates. I just want to minister to somebody for just a few moments. This is where I feel the Holy Ghost wants us to go. In fact, why don't we just lift our hands and love the Lord for just a moment. I want to transition into this right now. I want the Lord to speak to us. Come on. I want you to ask God to help you for just a moment. I want you to pray His Spirit will be with us and upon us. In the name of Jesus. Come on. I'm coming down to where you are. In the name of Jesus. Come on, I want to connect with somebody. I want to help you right now. Listen to me. I'm 33 years old, and I come from a broken home. Is this all right? I come from a world that where my mom and dad were married, and, and everything was looking great. Everything was fine. But something took place, something that was, was unorthodox in my mind because I'm playing drums. I'm five years old, and, and I start playing drums in church, and everything's great. Here I am, and I, I have a mom, and I have a dad, and my sister, who's four years younger than I am, and we get to this point where I'm in third grade, and my mom gives us the devastating news and says, Jason, my, 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 my world is, is, is rolling, saying, what's she going to talk to me about? I have no clue. And she says, your father and I are getting a divorce. Our world's crashing. My sister was daddy's little pumpkin girl. And this was everything that we wanted it to be. And I'm sitting here thinking in my mind, I remember adolescent tears are streaming down my face. My world's crushing down. Everything's falling apart. I'm not supposed to be the product of a divorced family. I mean, I'm a child of God. Hallelujah. But it happens. The reality strikes. My mother and father get a divorce. And so we're left all by ourselves. My dad moves off to North Carolina. And with the begging and the pleading of my parents, they get back together again. We moved to North Carolina. We're there for two years. And while we're there, my dad decides to come to the altar one night in the middle of a revival service with the McDaniel family. And they're singing the old song, I Thank God for the Lighthouse, an incredible song that moved my father to repentance. And I remember as a 12-year-old kid, excuse me, I was 11 years old. I remember as an 11-year-old kid, I sat on the platform and I watched my dad come to the altar, tears streaming down his face, and he fell on the ground, and God graciously filled him with the gift of the Holy Ghost. It took two hours before my dad could get in his vehicle and drive because he was so overcome by the power of the Holy Ghost. And I tell you that God can do it again today. Here's what the reality is, is everything was fine for about a year and a half. My family and I went to Florida, back to Florida for camp one year. And you know how it is after camp. You come back on a high and you're excited. Everything's going great and everything's rocking. But the reality is this, we come back home to an empty house because my father had a relapse. My dad pawned everything in our house except for our couch and our beds because he could not give in to the reality of that. I'm not going to be in drugs anymore. But in fact, he let it all go and he spent everything in our house just to get high for one night. What are you talking about, preacher? I'm talking about the moments that we thought we overcame the crushing process, but another process was coming. And so my parents divorced again for the second time. Here we are. Fast forward. I'm in the 10th grade. It's my second semester. Things are tight for our family. I dropped out of high school just to make ends meet for our family. And everything is stressed out and everything is difficult for us. And we're sitting here struggling and we're wondering, God, when's the breakthrough going to come? I moved off to Bible college. I didn't survive but one semester there. I had to move back home because my mother wasn't able to make ends meet by herself and all these things I'm supposed to be a preacher I'm supposed to do this I'm going to go there and I have all these great intentions for my life but I cannot seem to get through this crushing process reality checks my life and God gets a hold of me one day and he says Jason you have to understand that my ways are indeed higher than your ways and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. And I found this little verse in Jeremiah 29, 11, where it said, I know the thoughts I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Well, how do you think I can live with that when my whole world is falling apart, when my family's going crazy, my sister's getting pregnant out of wedlock, and my mom and dad's divorced not once but twice from each other, and my dad's back, so and all these things in my world, I want to tell you something right now. I do not look at that as a discount for my God's anointing on my life, but I come to tell you, and I'm here today because I realized that he was wounded for every transgression. He was wounded. Um, hallelujah. Everything I went through was because God had a purpose for my life. 
would like to tell somebody today that it doesn't matter what family tree you come from. By the grace of God, you can start a new branch. You can walk out of this room today. You can say, I'm not who I used to be. I'm not going to be bound by things any longer. I've come to experience Pentecost. I've come to experience an undeniable encounter of the Holy Ghost. I want to ask you, are you ready for God to do something great in your life? Are you ready for the Holy Ghost to minister to you? What do you want God to do? Everything you need, he can do it. You've just got to be willing to step out in faith and say, I want it. I need it, God, in my life. Let's lift our hands and love the Lord together, shall we? Let's just lift our hands and our voices right now. In the name of Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. Let's fast forward just a little bit. I don't, I, I, I'm not going to be much longer, but I want you to listen to me. I have a purpose for what I'm preaching about today. Coming from a divorced family puts a lot of stigma on your life. Especially when you're that little boy that's looking through the window of your bedroom and all the other kids are playing with their dads and you have no dad to play with. So I'm supposed to get married now and move on with my life and hopefully I can change the generational curses that have been over my life and say that just because I didn't have a father doesn't mean I can't be a good daddy. I'm preaching to somebody in this room right now. I feel in the Holy Ghost. I meet this beautiful young lady by the name of Michael from Bossier City. Hallelujah. The greatest thing since the Holy Ghost. Praise God. You may not think so, but hallelujah. We get married on April 28th of 2007, and we immediately begin our journey in ministry. Five years goes down, and we're ready to have children and expand our family, only to realize that for some reason we cannot conceive a child. We've been to the doctors, tests, everything, nothing to prevent it. We're ready to become parents, but for some reason we could not conceive a child. So we just decided that we're going to trust God and whatever he wants us to do is great. On April the 13th of 2012, Friday the 13th, we get a phone call. Some of friends of ours in Texas. And they said, hey, we need to talk to you guys about something very serious. We're thinking, okay. You know, we just got out of church. It was our Sheets for Christ kickoff rally. Hallelujah. Oh, what's going to happen now? Who do I owe money to at this point, you know? <laughs> Don't act like you've never been there before. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. Praise God. Look, this is my sermon. I'm sticking to it, okay? <laughs> on the other line, they said that there's a baby that has been born or going to be born in Dallas on Monday the 16th. And it's a biracial baby. And nobody in our files at this time is willing to adopt a biracial baby. Well, okay. What's the point? Will you guys do it? Absolutely. I mean, I don't care about it being biracial. I mean, red and yellow, black and white, we're all precious in his sight. Now you're getting what I'm saying. Well, how much does it cost, Brother Gaddy? Oh, it's $24,000. Did I tell y'all we was broke? I mean, like, we were broke, busted, and disgusted. And so we start talking to Tom Veely from New Beginnings, and we find out some information. It's $24,000. Being a licensed minister gives you a 10% discount. Hey, I'll take all the money I can get. So that's, that's a knockoff right there. And so things are looking great. And we're just like, okay, so what do we need to do? And they said, well, you need, to, uh, you need to go ahead and get some money together, see if you can get a loan. And Christian Credit Union in California called American. So I called them, and, and for some reason, to give us a loan. It's not like they're going to repossess a baby or something. It's just it's not going <laughs> to. I mean, I've put it back on the shelf. <laughs> it cries too much. No, you know. <laughs> I don't know. This is it's just not the reality. So. We started calling some friends and family, and um, within 28 hours, God had miraculously given to us in our hands $12,700 for this adoption. (laughs) 
We've come through all this time. My, my, my wife is looking at all the steps that are going on. One church alone invited us that weekend to preach. It's the most I've ever been paid for a sermon. I got $6,000 check for the adoption. I doubt it'll ever happen again, hallelujah, but it's good. So we get in our car and we're driving to Dallas. We're static. We're stoked. We're just crazy. We meet the birth mother. We meet the baby. 30 minutes after the baby was born, we were at the hospital. We meet, we connect, we go back to our hotel and there's tears in our eyes and we're just, and I'm thinking, oh man, that poor baby, I'm going to be its father. <laughs> we wake up on Tuesday morning and get the phone call, don't come to the hospital. The birth mother's changed her mind. Now you talk about a crushing, Brother Gaddy. God gave us 12, my God, I pay my tithes, what are you doing, Jesus. I'm, I'm sitting here wondering, you have given us $12,700 and now the baby's not even ours? I was about to bust a cap. And my mind is going crazy, wondering, what is God up to? For two long months, we feel like we're crushed. For two long months, we feel like we are the target of the adversary. You're going to be just like your father. That's why you can't have a baby Come on, somebody. You're going to fall into the pattern of divorce just like your parents. That's why you don't have a child. And the enemy began to mess up my mind until God got a hold of me and said, hang on one second. Don't you remember the time that I saved you? When I saved you, that means I was going to carry you through the hard times, through the pain, through the frustration, through the weariness. I'm a God that loves you in the strong times as much as in the weak times. Fast forward to June, June the 8th, we get a phone call to come down to Tupelo, and we get in our car, and we drive from Jackson, about a two-hour drive, and we get done eating dinner, and they close the book on our home study, and by the way, all the things that we did with New Beginnings was totally out of order. They broke a lot of their protocol because they knew that this child had to have a home, but in the meantime, in our mind of crushing and frustration, it was evident that God was working things out because they closed the books on the home study. And they opened the book on a baby that had been born and was not in Dallas, but the baby was 82 miles away from my front door in Memphis. What's interesting to note about this child was that he was already born, already existing before we even found out about the first baby. The first child was born on April 16th. This baby boy that we're finding about in Memphis was born on April the 4th. Born at 28 weeks, weighing two pounds, eight ounces. The doctor said, there's some things you got to be concerned about. Number one, being a premature baby, he's going to have some issues with behavior. I'm like, I got that. Don't worry about it. I'm his daddy. I got that. Apple don't fall off from the tree. Hallelujah. I got that. He said, you need to understand that when they're preemies like that, we check for bleeding on the brain. We check for the function of the lungs, the eyes, the hearing. And because this child's birth mother was a drug addict, we checked for withdrawals. I want to report to you today that when we got to the hospital, we looked through all those medical reports. That child passed every test, had no indications of bleeding on the brain, no issues with withdrawals, hearing is great, eyes are great, lungs are great. I just tell you, we serve a great God. Show them the first picture for me. I know you guys probably can't see it back there. But that's my wife and that's me. I knew you knew that, didn't you? And that's my little boy, London, right there. We got to the hospital on the 15th of June, Father's Day weekend. What a great gift for Father's Day. And we stayed there for three days. I got to go to Jackson on the 16th, the Sunday morning, Father's Day, and tell the whole entire, or the 17th, and tell the whole church, you know, I sent this whole setup and everything because I'm a tech nerd. I like this stuff, you know. And I put this cool presentation together. And I showed them that we're going to be parents. And the church went crazy. That's why it's important to be a part of the church because they're your family. And if you're a guest here, I want to tell you without any hesitation, this is where you ought to come every single week. And everybody from New Life said amen. amen. The reality is this, that little boy right there overcame a lot of odds. When we met him, he was 10 weeks old. In order to leave the hospital, you have to be 5 pounds, 4 ounces. He was five pounds, six ounces the day we took him home. Show him the next picture. This is when we received the birth certificate. We had his name changed. 
We had a social security name change, all that stuff. Because that's my baby. He may not be my blood, but he's my baby. His first Christmas, next one, we told him there was no, you know, so he kind of freaked out. You guys can't see it. I'll have to show you. I'll give you like the VIP version later. All right? Y'all ain't ready for this. I'm just telling you. Lonnie, you're not getting any gifts this year. That's what he did, you know. <laughs> Going through all the steps, all the crushing process, all the turmoil, all the pain. You see why I'm preaching about this today? I didn't come here to give you some pretty prepped out sermon. I just came to be real with you today. I came to get on your level and tell you that God is a provider of everything that you need. It may not come when you want it, but honey, it's going to be right on time every time. Go to the next picture. That's us in New York City. He was excited to be there. The joy that's on the face of my family is the joy that proves that because he wears the victor's crown, we overcome. You feel the Holy Ghost in this room right now. I tell you in, in, the, in the fear of God that somebody's going to walk out of this building today and your life is never going to be the same. It's not because of what I'm saying. But in just a few seconds, you're going to have a chance to come to this altar. I see tears all across this congregation. I see people that are hurting, people that have been through some crushing moments. But I want to tell you something. When it's all said and done, that oh, that gladness is going to come out of you. And when it comes out of you, it's going to be joy, unspeakable joy. And it's going to be full of glory. And I know there's times where you cry yourself to sleep at night, but he was wounded. I know there's times where you wish that your family was back together again. Hang on, he was wounded. I realize there's moments when you feel so frustrated, you want to throw the talent and run away. Honey, just hang on. He was wounded. I want to tell you very quickly today, I'm a living witness that God is still on the throne. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And besides him, there is no other God. His name is Jesus. He loves us so much that he died for us. But more importantly, he got up again. We serve a risen Savior. We serve a God that's not dead, but he's surely alive. How do you know, preacher? I can literally feel him in my hands. I can feel him in my feet. He walks with me. He talks with me. He tells me I'm his own. I want to tell you, he was wounded. He was wounded. Come on, clap your hands unto God. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. I'm trying to help somebody today to tell you God's on your side and it's God before you who can be against you. He knows your name. He knows the numbers of hair on your head. He's concerned about your future. I ask us today, what can wash away our sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes us white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. For I see a crimson stream of blood. It's there for my life. It's there for my hope. It's there for my joy. It's there for my restoration. He was wounded so I can have life and have it more abundantly. And if that's not enough, would you stand your feet with me this morning? Romans 8, 14 tells us, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For they have not received the Spirit of bondage again to fear. Here it is. But ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit therefore itself bears witness with our spirit that we are indeed the children of God. And if children and heirs, heirs of God, joint heirs of Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified with him. Here's what speaks to me in volumes. For I reckon that the sufferings of this 
present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. I can't see the promise right now, but he was wounded. The doctor's report is against my will and my wishes, but he was wounded. Our finances are the worst they've ever been in our life, but he was wounded. We cannot seem to put our family back together again. You're in the right house because the God of creation wants to be your heavenly father today and he wants to make a way of provision for your life. He really was wounded. I want you to lift your hands across this congregation. I feel the Lord in this room right now. Jesus, would you begin to lift up your voices?